<clears throat> so this is the fourth pre-class lecture for uh, bioinformatics, bio 410, bio, bio 510 uh, that I teach here at California State University, Monterey Bay. And today um, we're going to talk about evolution. Um, specifically, we're going to talk about how we use evolution to study, uh, to understand genomics um, and how it contributes to our understanding of evolution of species and evolution in general. And uh, we're going to particularly focus in on molecular evolution. And um, when we talk about molecular evolution, we're talking about mutations uh, as one of the key components of that process. So let's start off at a good at a good sort of broad sense of why we might think evolution is important. We'll turn to the good old quote by uh, Theodosius Dobzhansky, the famous geneticist who said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Evolution is the context by which life is progressing. And through a thorough understanding of it, we can better uh, understand the function and history and uh, factors affecting uh, the life sciences and life in general. So it's very important that we have a solid understanding and understand why we want to apply this context to these types of questions. Um, as an exemplar, we can look at uh, an area such as comparative genomics, which really is the basis for how we conduct almost all modern uh, medical science, you know, anything where we're using a model organism to preliminarily uh, assess um, something that we might think have a functional role or be involved in the proper function of a system or perturbed function of a system, um, we're often using a comparative approach to gain insight into that. And in the field of genetics and genomics, it's especially important that we provide this understanding. Um, and so we'll see, uh, this is an example over here on the right, looking at um, the evolution of chromosomes um, in, in vertebrates and, and showing that, you know, through some careful mapping and, um, and tracking based upon sequence similarities, we can identify, you know, what were the ancestral uh, uh, karyotypes of the chromosomes and makeup of chromosomes that ended up becoming the modern group of fishes and birds and vertebrates that we see today, right? And by doing this, we are looking at patterns, uh, patterns of syntony. And so by syntony, syntony, we're referring to uh, large sections of chromosomes that are conserved in their gene order. So there's something that's the same between you know, we see that the region of syntony is conserved uh, where, you know, we might have chromosome 18 here, right, which is very similar to chromosome 9 in birds, which is conserved in gene order with this ancestral vertebrate um, uh, karyotype. So these are some of the ways that we're able to um, do this. And, you know, when we looked at these patterns, uh, we can see that these Chromosomes, even though they have different numbers, if we look at their sequences, they actually have what we refer to as homology to each other or shared ancestry. And it's through things like this where we can track molecular changes along a genome and how that recapitulates the patterns of evolution that we've seen um, between different chromosomes that have shared ancestry that we can get a better understanding of the story of evolution, of the evolution of organisms, the evolution of function, the evolution of biodiversity, and the things that underlie that bio biological diversity um, using molecular tools. So studying molecular evolution is one of the key ways and clearest ways that we can actually study evolution because the molecular information is a lot less is a lot clearer and a lot less con convoluted than when we look at phenotypes. It's one of the reasons why it's so important for us to look at this. And because we're looking at genetics and we're looking at genomes, uh, 
In this case, it's particularly important that when we think about evolution that we're talking about molecular evolution, right? Um, evolution that's, that's happening, happening at the molecular level to the DNA um, that are in all these organisms, right? Uh, and so when we think sort of broadly about evolution, um, I think it's important that first we describe what we talk about when we talk about evolution. Uh, and I am a population geneticist by training, um, so my definition is going to be a little bit mathematical, but I think that helps us too, because it helps us understand that when we talk about evolution, we actually are talking about it in a very mathematically explicit framework. Um, so for me, evolution are changes in allele frequency over time. And there are some implied um, uh, components when we see genetic allele frequencies change over time. And that is that these things would be heritable, right? They would be passed on from generation to generation. And these changes in frequency um, would, um, we think, be related to changes in the actual organisms, right? Um, just so we're clear, when we talk about alleles, right, these are sequence variants that uh, occur at a, a particular locus. When we talk about polymorphisms, uh, where we might see variation at a particular locus, more than one allele, this is when you find an allele variant at a locus that is observed, typically we would say greater than 1% of the population of a species. So we can see more than one allele at any one position. Uh, when we talk about what drives evolution, what are the factors that contribute to evolution, there's generally uh, five principal factors that we would identify being the main contributing forces. Um, and these entities are drift, mutation, migration, recombination, and selection, right? Um, now, natural selection is the one that we often hear the most about of these evolutionary forces, but these other four forces, drift, mutation, migration, recombination, are incredibly important to the evolutionary process and are often given short shift, I think, in sort of a popular um, uh, approach and also sometimes by biologists to what's actually driving the dynamics of the system. Uh, we tend to focus a lot on natural selection in part because it's become um, such an important part of our conversation about evolution. Uh, of course, this was originally formulated uh, as, as the main mechanism of speciation by Alfred Wallace and Charles Darwin um, in The Origin of Species, which was published back in the mid-1800s, right? Darwin wrote, as many more individuals of each species are born than can possibly survive, and as consequently there is a significantly recurring struggle for existence, it follows that any being, if it vary, however slightly, in any manner, profitable to itself, under the complex and sometimes varying conditions of life, will have a better chance of surviving and thus be naturally selected. For the strong principle of inheritance, from the strong principle of inheritance, any selected variety will tend to propagate its new and modified form. So there are a bunch of criteria that Darwin outlines here that drives this pattern of evolution by natural selection, which we could also call when we see evolution through natural selection as a change in allele frequencies. Um, so what are these criteria? I think it's important that we understand what they are and so when we think about how we might look at them from a molecular standpoint we have a good understanding of what we might be looking for one we would expect to see a variation in a trait right um, the, and this variation would have to be somehow tied to the fitness or reproductive capacity or success of an organism we tend to refer to this as phenotypic variation right so if we're thinking about it from a genetics point standpoint, we would need to have some sort of genetic variation that contributes to phenotypic variation. Uh, we need to see that whatever variation, uh, uh, whatever trait where we see variation in, that there is heritability of that trait. So um, that variation not only has to exist, it can't just be you know, plastic response to the environment. It's gotta be something that's heritable and passed on. Um, there needs to be some sort of competition for resources um, that, uh, the, that is influenced by uh, that trait. So that trait has to somehow be associated um, with some sort of consequence, right? And this brings up the idea of fitness. So 
uh, we, in a general sense, uh, the the commonly the common way we view this is survival of the fittest, but we're not actually really talking about uh, a specific individual in that case, right? What we're actually thinking about is what makes someone more, what makes an organism more fit. In this case, the currency of an evolutionary biologist is lifetime reproductive success, which you can basically translate in its, in its probably easiest sense to the number of offspring you produce. Right, so how good are you at pat how successfully you are passing on your genes, your genetic information to the next generation? Um, we can look at um, uh, some comparisons of uh, sequences to sort of guide us along this process of how we might use um, genetic information and molecular information and uh, to explore the evolution of something, right? Um, and so if we think about um, a, a conserved protein like trypsin, um, here we might look at some comparisons between um, proteins that carry out the same function um, but may not be exactly the same in their sequence, right? Um, and so uh, you know, we have here uh, trypsin, which is a, a serine protease involved in the digestion of meat. Um, its function is that it cleaves peptide chains mainly at the carboxyl side of the enzyme, uh, the, uh, the amino acids lysine and arginine, um, except when it's followed by a proline. Uh, it's found in lots of different organisms, and it basically carries out the same type of function in each of those organisms. Um, we see that there's effectively three essential amino acids identified by these colors that are that form the active site of trypsin and um, what we have is an example here where we have three different sequences sequence one sequence two sequence three all of trypsin and all line to each other so what does align mean this means that we're lining up the sequences so they match where they are uh, mostly similar to each other so notice in this case that there are exactly the same three amino acids um, in each of these three different sequences, which could represent three different species, all lined up in the same place, right? So we have something that's conserved. We have the same amino acid in the same place of this protein. Other amino acids may change, right? But we have these same three in this in the same spot, which is right in this active site. And what we might think that would confer is that because we see the same thing in these spots, we would identify the highly high likelihood that we might see the same function of this protein, which is what we observe. Um, so when we think about a region and why it might be conserved, a function is not the only way. So we refer to these things as homologs, basically genes that have proteins that have shared ancestry, right? Um, so, you know, one of the main reasons that we see the same amino acids conserved in these regions is that, you know, this region is somehow essential for the function. So this process that trypsin um, takes a part of is going to be key to the function of that protein. And if we were to change, when those amino acids were to change, trypsin would lose its function, which is necessary for the organism. Um, sometimes uh, regions though are conserved not because of a functional purpose, but again, proteins are three-dimensional um, entities, right? So uh, their actual structure and how they fold is also very important. So it could be that it's um, important for its form. That's another reason. And the final reason uh, we might see a region that is conserved is that they just come from a common ancestor. So because they have a shared history, you know, it hasn't been a long enough time for that um, uh, uh, protein sequence to change, it may be the same just because of that reason. Um, so these are sort of some of the reasons why we look for patterns of conservation. And notice that like each of these gives us a little bit inf different information about what the protein does. And I think the key point, to, key point to understand here is what we're looking at are patterns of similarity and patterns of dissimilarity. And those are the things that give us insight to what are the molecular bases for differences that we see in phenotypes that are driven by genetic differences, right? So these patterns of difference and similarity are key in our understanding of how genetics
actually translates up into phenotype. So what are some other examples of um, conserved regions and proteins and how they can be informative to us? Uh, well, we can look at something like P53, right? P53 is not an enzyme in this case. It's actually a transcription factor. Um, and what it does is it binds to DNA, uh, which has a, a consensus sequence that can be associated with it. Basically, it has um, on its, uh, uh, it's looking for a sequence um, that has either an A or a G and another A and a G and another A or a G and then a C and then um, could be a T or T A and then a G and then either a C or a T, a C or a T, a C or a T and then could be zero to 13 nucleotides and then basically um, the, that same previous uh, motif that's on this side. Right, so it's just basically it's got like a, a, a motif, a rather complicated motif that it can bind to in census sequence. Um, and what's important about this is that within P53, there's this region of the protein that binds to this consensus sequence. And, and we refer to that consensus sequence uh, binding region as the DNA binding domain. So a per certain part of the protein that binds, uh, uh, that binds the DNA. And one of the really interesting things is that when we look across organisms, we note that this DNA binding domain is actually a, a pretty well conserved region within P53. And why is it conserved? Because it has an essential function, right? So things that are conserved often have some sort of core essential function because if a mutation happens there, and that region suddenly can't do the thing that it used to do, it becomes really bad. So, you know, if we look at an alignment between um, a human and um, Placozoa, so that was this picture over here. These are like little marine invertebrates. They're kind of ancient marine organisms. They're, they, they just look like little blobs that you might find in your aquarium. Um, what we can see in this sequence alignment is when we look at this um, DNA binding region, right here we see that uh, a bar is an identical match, a colon is a similar match, meaning that the amino acids are similar to each other in um, their chemical properties and dissimilar where they're not similar in their chemical properties. So if we look across these two proteins, what we'll notice here is that there's a lot of identical matches and, and, and similar matches in this one region of the, pro, of the protein compared to others. So these, this region looks to be conserved across these two different organisms, which are incredibly distant taxa. It's been a long time since uh, you know, we shared a common ancestor with Placozoa. So when we think about P53, it's important that we understand uh, what its function is for us. And so, uh, you know, just to give you a little background, in cancer biology, there are basically two type categories of genes that are of particular importance that are involved in the proliferation of cells or uh, the disruption of the normal cell cycle, right? And one of these types is are tumor suppressors. And P53, or as known in humans as TP53, is uh, one of these such genes. And that's gene, this gene's function is basically to suppress can for cancer formation. And it does that through restraining cell growth and, and um, initiating apoptosis or scheduled cell death. Additionally, there are oncogenes such as uh, uh, CRAS. Um, and so oncogenes, these are genes that um, are uh, experience changes and become overactive due to some sort of activating mutation, right? And, and tumor suppressors tend to experience loss of function mutations where they stop suppressing uh, unrestra uh, unrestrained cell growth, right? And um, so oncogenes have these activating mutations or uh, end up being expressed at levels that we would not uh, normally have them at. And what they do is they send signals to pro the, the cell to proliferate, right? And uh, before they experience these mutations, we typically refer to them as proto-oncogenes because they haven't yet become oncogenes. Um, so you have tumor suppressors, which are restraining cell growth. 
oncogenes, which when they get activated, encourage cell growth. And these are basically the two types of things that um, uh, can really help contribute to um, cancer when it, when it occurs. So what is the function of P53 in more detail? Um, basically, uh, it's this transcription factor, but it, it is activated when a cell is under stress, and particularly when a cell has uh, experienced some sort of damage to the DNA, which, of course, if we're thinking about mutations that can lead to cancer-like damage, DNA is a bad thing. Um, and so uh, once it's activated, um, it increases in its concentration, increases the nucleotide, it binds the elements within several genes. Um, and then once it's bound, uh, these genes express um, either more or less transcript, uh, depending upon what they do. Um, and uh, what this change in, in gene expression does is it basically causes the cell to stop dividing. So there is a cell cycle process. When P53 is initiated, it, it doesn't allow the cell to go past this G1 checkpoint and, and complete the cell cycle, right? And um, what it does is it uh, basically causes the cell to initiate either an apoptotic process where um, it's a scheduled cell death where the cell will eventually die, or it'll uh, initiate a DNA repair mechanism so that then you can safely resume proliferation or it'll just permanently stop the cell from dividing so it won't let it continue. So you know you can imagine that when this gene becomes non-functional that therefore becomes problematic for um, regulating cell growth and cancer in this case. So when we think about what happens during uh, cancer is that we have normal cells which become cancer cells. And one of the interesting things about this is it kind of ends up being a little model for us and how molecular evolution can, can work. Um, because here we're having mutations that are happening and it causes changes in the function of the cell. And, um, you know, you have cancer cells basically competing with normal cells, right? So um, we've got molecular genetic change, which is heritable. It's passed on to, to um, subsequent cell line uh, uh, progeny. Um, uh, and they're competing for uh, a limited resource, right? Um, and so uh, what we have is kind of a limited type of natural selection so that, that can occur in multicellular organisms. Um, cancer cells and their progeny um, generally will outcompete normal cells for resources and continue to replicate. So in a sense, these progeny are more fit. Obviously, uh, that's not the case for the organism's health as a whole, but they're more fit than the normal cell progeny. Um, and another really interesting thing about cancer cells is that they undergo really high rates of mutation in order to, to achieve this phenotype. And... Um, these same types of uh, mutations, um, albeit at much lower frequency, are the kinds of things that drive the evolution of species and create the diversity of life that we see today and everything that's out there. So it's like a little uh, a, a, a sub example of how evolution can proceed. So what, what does it look like? What do mutations look like in P53? Um, and I think it's important here that we also just take a second to recognize that when I'm talking about mutations, what I'm talking about is a change in the DNA sequence, right? Um, this is, uh, this change in DNA sequence um, is basically um, the result of an error in DNA replication or when there is damage and a failure to repair that damage, right? There's some, something that changes the DNA, which should be an exact copy in every cell from what it's supposed to be. Um, so T53 is frequently observed to have mutations, and these mutations can lead to protein sequence changes, which lead to the inactivation of P53, P53, TP53, and allow for the cell cycle to be unregulated and cancer cells to proliferate. Um, and generally, the kinds of mutations we see are going to be point mutations, so one single nucleotide changing that can lead to changes in amino acid sequence. So if we think of those codons we talked about earlier, right? we see an individual uh, mutation occurring and that then in turn changes the amino acid sequence.
Um, what's interesting specifically in P53, notice that where mutations occur, so here we have a frequency histogram of about over 8,000 tissues, right, of, of um, P53 mutations, and you can see along this sequence, right, these are all the different codons um, that are in uh, P53. And where do we see mutations happening? Do they happen equally and evenly across, across the cell, um, across the genome, excuse me, across this gene uh, when people experience cancer? No, there are certain amino acids, 175, 284, 2, 237, right, that are particularly mutational hotspots for cancer, right? And by hotspots, I mean that, that they are more frequently observed, right? And when we see cancer, and so what that means is these regions are particularly important. They must have some sort of particular importance for this specific phenotype, right? And in this case, the reason why is that these spots are very much associated with the capacity for P53 to bind to DNA, right? And without, with mutations in these spots, they disrupt the function, the normal function of the protein and no longer allow it to work how it should, right? So we can see that because these are not conserved, the function is lost and we get the evolution of a new phenotype. One that is not good for the organism as a whole, but is good for the replication of those cancer cells. So again, this brings us back to this over idea of what evolution is and how it can work, right? And I think what's particularly important when we think about molecular evolution is this idea of mutation, right? We often refer to mutation in evolution as the engine of evolution because we need genetic variation to underlie the phenotypic differences that we see in order for evolution to occur, right? We have to have these genetic variations Otherwise, we don't have the capacity to pass on these heritable changes, right? We can't change these allele frequencies either through selection or recombination or drift if we're not making new genetic variants. Um, and so I think it's important for us to understand mutation um, and what it is. So there's some different classes of mutations. There are synonymous mutations. There are non-synonymous mutations, neutral, del deleterious, and advantageous mutations. Uh, basically, synonymous mutations are ones where we have a, a mutation that occurs, an amino, a DNA sequence um, change that occurs, but it doesn't lead to any sort of change in the codon or the protein sequence uh, uh, of the subsequent um, uh, amino acid associated with that protein, right? So in this case, like if, if we were to look at a codon, if we had a mutation from a T to a C, right, this codon would still code for a serine, so that's a synonymous mutation. Whereas if it goes from a, uh, if this uh, went from a C to a T, right, and went to TTC instead of TCC, that would be a non-synonymous mutation, so we change the amino acid that it was coding for. Um, a neutral mutation is basically a mutation that doesn't have any effect on the organism or progeny, so a synonymous mutation could also be neutral. Um, a deleterious mutation is one that decreases the fitness of an organism. So a lot of mutations, you know, there's no, they just happen, right? And whether or not it's good or bad is sort of dependent upon a lot of other factors, right? So most mutations we actually think of as being deleterious. Um, there are cases, though, where we ha might have an advantageous mutation. And this would um, lead to sort of the an increase in fitness of an organism. Um, So um, there are other types of mutations as well. Um, there are um, insertion um, deletions, uh, so uh, and other types of specific point mutations. There are other types of mutations as well. So there are point mutations. Um, where we just are looking at you know a single nucleotide change. Um, there, are, when we talk about point mutations, there are typically two categories. One we would refer to as a transition, the other one is a transversion. 
So a transition is when you go from a purine to a purine, or from an A to a G, or from a pyrimidine to a pyrimidine, so from a C to a T, or vice versa. A transversion is when you go from either a purine to a pyrimidine or a pyrimidine to a purine, right? So you can imagine that um, that actually is a big difference. You know, p uh, transitions are more common in, in, uh, in nature as opposed to transversions, and that could be due to a variety of different reasons, but in part it may be due just to the physical, the physical stress that that might lead to or, or, or be facilitated in the organism. In, a dis in addition to that, there are indels, um, so a mutation that results in an insertion or deletion uh, of nucleotides from a genome. We refer to that as an indel. Over here, you have an example where there's just some slippage during um, uh, replication or DNA synthesis that causes a region either to be cut out or added in. And so... Um, what this can lead to, especially in coding sequences, something we refer to as a frame shift mutation, right? So if we think about proteins, right, they're coding for codons in three base pair units. And so if you removed two base pairs from that region for some reason, that would throw off the frame that the um, uh, 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 translation machinery is reading. And so you'd no longer be looking at every three bases, right? Suddenly like you would have thrown it off and you'd be off by two. Um, and, uh, you know, an example of a disease where indels is really important is Huntington disease, right? Where we see like an actual increase in CAG sequences um, in one part of the protein. Um, and this in turn leads to things like brain wasting. So uh, obviously these indels can have um, huge importance to organisms. So um, here we can see example of where if you put in a, uh, a mutation, right, you'll, you'll suddenly frame shift and change the amino acids that are, that are actually being um, coded for in this case, right? So this glutamine and alanine get changed to a lysine and histidine. There are um, other types of um, uh, mutations. Uh, genomic rearrangements are one example of these. So uh, here we might refer to them uh, where we see the crossing over or um, mixing up of chromosomes. Um, these are typically referred to as gen genomic rearrangements, uh, translocations where you have part of a chromosome fusing with another, inversions where a chromosome might break and then flip, so it inverts itself and it reattaches the same chromosome. Um, you can have gene amplification occurring where you get lots of copies of um, genes uh, in various parts of the genome. Um, and again, that term syntony comes up when it's really important when we think about this, because when we think about chromosomes in these contexts, we're thinking about the order of genes along a chromosome. So that's sort of the main mechanism by which we might be able to um, track these sorts of things. And so, you know, like we can look at a disease like a chronic uh, uh, myelogenous uh, leukemia, and in, in this case, right, it is actually a, a, a a transversion, a translocation, sorry, between um, uh, chromosome 9 and chromosome 22, which leads to the combination of, of this BCR and this CABL gene coming together and fusing to form um, this BCR, uh, BCR ABL oncogene, right? So then that's going to promote cancer. Um, and that can be one of the, these examples of a problematic translocation. Um, I think it's interesting to see, you know, um, we think not just in disease, but the evolution of organisms. If you look at this comparison between like human and chimps, um, you can see that, you know, we think about the fact that there, our genomes are so similar between humans and chimps, right? There is a high similarity between them, very little sequence divergence. Um, but what we can see is that there are other kinds of changes, right? Like there are differences in the chromosomal structure, in um, the syntenic structure of these chromosomes and how they're arranged with each other. And this kind of variation can also help contribute to the, to the variation we see among species. So it's not just about genetic content, it's also about the order of genes and their placement on chromosomes.
Another mechanism by which mutations occur um, is through um, viruses. So viruses uh, um, can actually change our genomes. Um, and actually, you know, a lot of our genomes are made up of viruses. And so um, particularly when we think about the life cycle of viruses, viruses are utilizing our, our cellular machinery to make more uh, copies of themselves, right? And especially genes such as retroviruses, part of how they do this, right, they don't have a DNA genome. They only have an RNA genome. So they actually have to copy themselves into our genome to hijack our cellular machinery to make more copies of themselves. So in the process of doing this, right, the thing that can happen is that the viral DNA uh, integrates itself into the genome and it picks up segments of our own DNA, merges it with um, the viral DNA, and then can actually transmit a gene uh, via the virus infecting another cell, leading to basically cancer through viral oncogenes. And, and it brings up like, an interesting concept when you think about how uh, uh, genetic information is sort of passed on to other groups or spread throughout an organism. Um, and we think about it, there are these basic two broad classes of gene transfer. One is through something we refer to as vertical gene transfer. And so we think about this as this typical reproduction, either sexual or asexual, right, where the parent is giving genetic information to the offspring. The other mechanism of, of gene transfer is um, referred to as horizontal gene transfer. So this is where DNA is transferred from you know, one organism to another organism, not through sexual or asexual reproduction, right? And this example that I showed previously, you know, where a virus is capturing this host gene uh, and then possibly transferring that host gene to another cell, right? That's a case of, of, of horizontal tran uh, uh, gene transfer. Um, and there's um, other cases of this with organisms, you know, especially in bacteria, it's very common for them to transport genes back and forth. But it also occurs in other species, you know, where we're able to co-opt um, different parts of other organisms' genetic makeup and integrate them into our genome, right? The example of the syncytiotrophoblasts in humans and that are used during placental development is a good example of this case or we've combined a piece of viral DNA with, you know, part of our normal uh, genome, and now we use that as a gene that's very important in the formation of a placenta. Um, when we think about these viral genomes, that brings us back to something that we, we talked about a little bit earlier when we talked about the parts of a genome, which are transposons. Um, and these transposons, these pieces of viral DNA that have gotten integrated in our genome, uh, they're really important to us because they can cause all kinds of mutations. Um, so transposons or mobile elements as we refer to them are segments of DNA that can move around your genome, right? So they can make copies of themselves and insert themselves in various locations of the cell. Um, there's basically two types, as I mentioned previously. Um, there are uh, class two and class one transposons. So class two transposons, which are basically DNA transposons, um, they offer, they function by a cut and paste process, whereas uh, the retro transposons um, tend to uh, function through a copy and paste process. Um, but all of this can lead to all kinds of um, duplications, inversions, um, uh, disruptions of normal gene function by sticking in a segment that hadn't been there before. Um, and, uh, you know, um, it's very interesting, you know, uh, a lot of these uh, elements are really important for important biological systems, the evolution of important biological systems that we use now, like how RAG1 and RAG2 are, uh, have helped contribute to our immune system evolution, or um, as I mentioned before, how we use all these viral elements, in including um, elements that control gene expression in the virus, um, in placental development. So, so, you know, these are functions that are core to who we are as an organism. So they're, they're, they're very important for us to understand. Um, it's important to note that these elements have all different types of components. You know, these are full things. They've got genes in them. They've got promoters. They've got RNA binding proteins. So there's a lot of actual genetic um, 
uh, machinery in there that we can make use of for evolutionary purposes. Um, and, you know, whenever I talk about this, these guys, I like to mention, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but uh, I think it's important to talk about Barbara McClintock, who um, gave us such incredible insight in this. I, I, I think she's a really impressive scientist and, and one we should be, we should, we should really celebrate. Um, you know, she was the third woman elected to the National Academy of Sciences, first female president of the Genetic Society of America. She won the Nobel Prize in, uh, for physiology or medicine in 1983 and was the first woman to ever win that prize unshared and the first American woman to win any Nobel Prize unshared, so just based on her work alone. And she won it for her work on mobile genetic elements. And she did a lot. Like she was like, I think she was the first person to uh, um, really describe recombination during meiosis, uh, how the centromeres function, um, what mobile genetic elements were. And through her work on mobile genetic elements, which she basically discovered through examining these unstable inheritance patterns uh, that were driving color mos mosaicism in maize back in the 50s, she discovered these these two genes, which or these two genetic elements, which we thought were driving this process: dissociator and activator, so DS and AC. And and what she described back in the early '50s was, was that they were actually moving. She made genetic maps and showed that, the, that these genes were actually moving uh, throughout the genome, and that dissociation actually couldn't couldn't do it without activator in its present. Um, so she was the one who came up with this term of like these these genetic elements that transpose, and um, was one of the first people to identify um, and and uh, call these things out as being you know, these mobile elements that were driving the regulation of genes. So she was one of the first people to describe gene regulation. Uh, and it, it's interesting because at the time she kind of stopped talking about it because scientists were like, what are you talking about? I mean, it was complicated at the time too, I get it. Like she came up with a pretty she not only was talking about mobile genetic elements but she was also talking about gene regulation which wasn't really widely accepted it wasn't until the 60s when jacob and monad came out with their work on the lac operon um, that people really started to bite into this concept of gene regulation and it's really unfortunate because you know she basically felt like she couldn't pursue it people thought she was uh um you know off in left field, right field somewhere, right? And so, um, but it, you know, she was an early uh, discoverer of this and I think a really incredible, I mean, coming up with these ideas at a time when no one else had them, I think just speaks a lot about a scientist. So um, in the seventies, basically uh, what they figured out too was that uh, DS and AC were actually, when they sequenced them, were tran DNA transposons. Um, so uh, scientists who made a lot of really incredible um, uh, contributions to our understanding of genetics and genomics and especially these repetitive elements. So um, one thing I think it's important to understand too is that uh, when we think about um, mutation, um, it, it generates genetic variation, right? And, and all of the differences that we see, but how do we interpret those differences? How do we actually examine those differences? Well, one of the main ways that we do that is through um, pairwise alignment of sequences. So uh, pairwise alignment of sequences, basically when you take your sequence, we look to see where they're the same and where they're different, right? We've done this throughout all of history in terms of experimentation. Where are things the same and where are they different? Well, we compare things. Well, in this case, we're looking at sequences and we're particularly interested in whether or not they can help us better understand homologs and the nature of their similarities and their differences. Again, when we talk about homologs, uh, these are going to be, uh, from a genetic standpoint, we're going to talk about them in terms of being genes that are related to other genes through, evolution, through evolutionary descent from a common ancestor, so they have shared ancestry. There are two types. There are paralogs and orthologs. Orthologs are one set of genes that descend from a single from a single gene in a common ancestor. And these set of genes um, typically we think of having diverged from each other due to, the evolution, of spe uh, due to evolution due to speciation. Um, and then paralogs are uh, one, or is one gene of a set of genes that underwent a duplication event in a common ancestor. So um, these are genes that have diverged from one another within a species due to duplication. 
so if we think about what does this kind of look like, right, we can see this case where we might have an ancestral species uh, that has gene X. Um, within uh, that species, we can see gene X duplicate into two copies, gene A and gene B. These are therefore paralogs, right? And then as we see these species, species two uh, continue to evolve, we can see we end up with species three and species four. So now what we see is that we have this case where we have um, gene A is a uh, ortholog to each other, right? And gene A and gene B are paralogs to each other. So gene A, gene A here are orthologs, gene B and gene B are orthologs, but gene A and gene B and gene A and gene B are actually paralogs to each other. So they're connected in this case through um, shared ancestry um, and in this case through duplication. Um, so yeah, we can align these sequences and then how do we assess these sequences once we align them? Um, I think in this case, it's important that we quantify the degree of, of relatedness or, or similarity or identity between these two sequences. And, and to do this idea of like how related these sequences are, there's basically two tools, two ways that we do this. One is identity and another one is similarity. And um, s identity is, uh, you know, it's a pretty straightforward measure, you know, how many residues are the identical between these two uh, uh, sequences in terms of their location, you know, if we divide that by the total sort of number, right? So, you know, example here, we have um, these two uh, short sequences and we can see, you know, four of them are identical out of five possible positions. So that's an 80% identity. So if we were to look at how patterns of identity might be associated with this previous idea of paralogs and orthologs, right? Um, if we think about a gene like TP53 in humans and mouse, uh, so say we're looking at like gene A as compared to gene A, right? This is about 84% similarity uh, percent identity we see between these in, um, in human and mouse, where if we were to compare, say, T53, TP53 to TP63, a different um, tumor suppressor gene, right, in humans, we can see the difference between A and B is actually 42% identity. Um, this isn't always the case, uh, but it gives you a sense of, like, what we're looking at when we're thinking about, you know, um, the differences between these genes. And the reason why we might say that is different, this is not always the best argument, but we might be able to make an argument in this case, is that, you know, TP53 in human and in mouse are basically doing the same function, whereas TP63 might be doing a different function than TP53, right? Um, if we are, were to go all the way back to placozoans in humans, though, keep in mind that TP53 was about like 29% identity. So the further you go back in history, like the more divergence you're going to see between sequences. Similarity was the other mechanism that I mentioned and, and uh, looking at, you know, the sort of uh, patterns of sameness or relatedness between, pro between sequences. Um, and this is particularly applied to proteins in this case. And so what we're looking here is the number of similar residues um, as opposed to identical residues. Um, and similarity, um, how it's defined is the fact that like when we look at um, various amino acids, right, some of them are going to have um, chemical properties that are going to be very similar to each other. Um, and so because of that, they might not be an exact match, but they're going to be close. So there might not be a match of uh, one in terms of an L to an L, but an L to an I may only be a partial mismatch, right? So it's only, there. there is some sort of chemical similarity between those amino acids. So it's not a zero when it's different from each other. It's just a little bit less than one. So if we think about an example here, we could take, you know, the following alignment and identify sort of dissimilar um, amino acids, identical amino acids, and amino acids that have some sort of chemical similarity. We can add them up. We get our similarity score, we can figure out what that is, and then um, figure out the percent similarity of the system. We take this, these measures of things like identity and similarity and apply them to something like ortholog comparison between uh, gene we were talking about before, trypsin, and uh, human and shrimp. We can see that 
you know, there are these similarities and where we see these similarities, they're often driven by these sort of conserved regions, these conserved amino acids that are important for things like the formation and establishment of disulfide bridges, which help stabilize um, the protein structure of these uh, uh, important proteins and let them accomplish their, their function. Uh, so we can see, you know, in this case, like because they have function, they have to share a certain amount of uh, identity between the two sequences, 42% identity in this case. And then we can see something like, uh, you know, looking at two paralogs in the histidine synthesis pathway. And we can see that the two enzymes here, um, while they are homologous by pyrology, we can see they have a much lower sequence identity between the two genes. Um, this is not an uncommon result when we think about the differences, how identities can help us understand the differences between the patterns of similarity between um, paralogs and orthologs. And what it might show you is that paralogs some often have different function because they have less identity with each other than orthologs, which might have a higher level of identity and have conserved sequences and thus conserved function. Um, finally, uh, I think another last important thing to think about when we, when we talk about mutations is how these sorts of transposure, these transposition events um, and other sort of events can lead to um, uh, factors that affect, you know, whole segments of a protein. So we're here, we're talking about big shifts, not just point mutations, like large sections moving and moving from uh, different segments. You could think of the BCRABL2 as an example of this. And I think it's important when we, we do this that to understand that it, it matters that proteins are actual modules, right? They're modular. They can see different segments that are functionally important. And so sometimes you can take that segment out and plug it into somewhere else, right? We, we generally refer to this process as exon shuffling. So this is another mutational process, which is actually really important in, in protein evolution. Um, and so here you can take a section out, we can put it in another place. Um, it's often mediated by something uh, referred to uh, by elements like retrotransposons, um, but it can be a way of really rapid evolution in systems, right? So you can have whole segments of um, a gene or a retro element or something else sort of popping out and popping back in, and this can lead to big changes in how a pro in um, uh, among different proteins so over we, here we have we have a, a specific instance where there's an l1 um, line sequence right which um, when it actively transposes to um, a different part in the genome right it it ends up um, pulling this e3 exon with it and inserting it um, into uh, this other gene and basically developing a different gene, right? So in this case, it's inserted itself between E1 and E2, where over here it was um, between E1 and E2. So now we've got a basically a completely new um, uh, gene structure. So um, those are sort of the basic premises by which um, we think molecular evolution is functioning. Um, in genomes, I think it's an important component for us to understand how evolution is working. And again, the emphasis here is trying to figure out um, what are the patterns of similarity, what are the patterns of differences between organisms. And in this case, we're using sequence information as that. And all of these mutational processes that we discussed are the mechanisms by which we observe these differences. And these mechanisms will be important for us later as we look to see, you know, can we model that process and what can we learn by modeling that process.